What is up, everybody? Ivy Ross here, uh, back on our book club series. Make sure you join the book club. It's lit. We're getting into From Here to Equality, chapter two. Uh, make sure you like and subscribe this video. We're gonna just jump right into chapter two. It's a long chapter, but I'm gonna get through it as quick as possible. Um, but yeah, I appreciate the support and let's get it. The title of chapter two, Myths of Racial Equality. So how, how this starts is by Randall Robinson. This gap is structural. It's not even about salary. Because the black community has been denied so much in wealth building tools, blacks, even middle class blacks, have no paper assets to speak of. They may be salaried, but they're only a few months away from poverty if they should lose their jobs. Because they've had nothing to hand down from generation to generation because of the ravages of discrimination and segregation, which were based in law until recently, and so that the black community economically is very vulnerable. And we have this enormous gap. You know, this reminds me of the last chapter that we read, the, the terrorism that black communities had to deal with on top of Jim Crow laws on why today we cannot compete economically. And so this chapter breaks that down. Now this gap was opened because of the deeds of the United States government, which has a responsibility to make that right. And that has to be a part of our demand. Chapter two kind of breaks down the three tiers of injustice uh, that form the basis for black reparations. Slavery, Jim Crow, and ongoing racial inequality and racism. So most Americans agree that both slavery and legal apartheid were horrific moral outrages, right? Most people agree with that. But there are alarmingly large numbers of Americans, both white and black, who do not believe that racial inequality and discrimination continue to exist. For them, blacks are fully engaged in every aspect of American life. If blacks are not drowning, they ask, why throw them a special lifeline? So an astonishing 38% of blacks contended that blacks are at least as well off or better off financially than whites. In addition, 38% of white respondents believe the nation has already made all the policy changes needed to give blacks equal rights with whites. Half of whites believed blacks are treated as fairly as whites in their encounters with the police. In contrast with a mere 16% of blacks. So that, that's, that's obvious. You know, most black people are definitely gonna overwhelmingly agree that they are treated less than when it comes to police. Uh, and of course, white people are going to believe that black people are treated fairly. Until I see videos of, you know, white people getting gunned down as much as black people, then we can have that conversation. But that's what this book is for. This book is to break down reality so that we can move forward. Because if we don't know reality, how are we going to deal with reality? Putting band-aids on and not actually addressing the root problem. So anyway, I continue. A striking 43% of blacks said a lack of motivation to work hard is an important factor producing black and white inequality. Pretty much ingrained the idea of, you know, bootstrapism, of just work hard. If you just work hard, you'll make it. And just simply, black people aren't working hard. That's what people are pretty much wanting to say. A significant proportion of blacks bought the view alleging that uh, black dysfunction helps explain racial inequality in the United States. And here from equality, we intend to convince you that America has not transcended racism, nor has the passage of the Civil Rights Act resulted in economic equality for African Americans, ADOS, nor did the election of a black man as a president signify the attainment of racial equality. And we can definitely see a lot of black and white people think that because we you know, got a black president, you know, somehow we've transcended race. But that is far from the truth. In this chapter, we will drill down on three errors that must be corrected. These errors are embodied in the following three erroneous beliefs. Racism and discrimination no longer exist in the United States. There are no significant economic disparities between blacks and whites. And to the extent that there are any residual racial economic disparities, they must be due to dysfunctional behavior on the parts of blacks. 
So this dangerous line of thinking alleges the black and white economic gap is due not to an acutely unequal playing field, but to blacks deficient skills, training and motivation. Its defenders allege that group-based inequality ultimately can be eliminated if black Americans enough willpower and do the right thing. Now that's what people are really trying to say to me. It's, you know, whistleblowing uh, racism to, to say that and know that you're pretty much saying that, that black people are deficient in skills, training, and motivation. We're just an un unmotivated group of people. We don't wanna work hard and we choose to be poor. That's pretty much what people are thinking. So according to this view, insofar as black Americans possess a capacity to improve their status by altering their own behavior, the nation can be absolved of responsibility. Ostensibly, once blacks as a group take these self-correcting actions, all disparities simply will fall away. And I think that's like every, you know, Republican or Democrat, you know, that's their dream, you know, that get everyone to believe that, oh, once black people finally get things together on their own, that's when everything will absolve. And we know that will never happen without reparations because we didn't get here by ourselves. It is important to acknowledge that whites control political and economic power in this country. No shift in the power relationship will be possible unless the society as a whole takes action to transform the structural conditions to make racial equality a real possibility. So wealth is the best single indicator of the cumulative impact of white racism over time. Wealth is the difference between what we own and what we owe, or the difference between the value of our assets and our debts, or the net value of our property. So wealth is uh, the economic measure that best captures individual, family, and household well-being. Wealth serves as a primary indicator of economic security. Wealthier families are better positioned to finance elite independent school and college education, access capital to start a business, finance expensive medical procedures, reside in higher neighborhoods, exert political influence through campaign financing, purchase better counsel if confronted with an expensive legal system, leave a bequest and or withstand financial hardship, hardship resulting from any number of emergencies, mm, COVID-19. Wealth provides financial agency over one's life. Simply put, wealth gives individuals and families choice. It provides economic security to take risks and shield against financial loss. That pretty much encompasses everything that reparations is, is, is trying to get to. That's the definition of closing the racial wealth gap is everything that I just said, you know, black people are able to do. And I can tell you 95% of what I just said and what was listed here, black Americans cannot freely do. Data from this 2016 survey of consumer finances, median black household net worth uh, is 17,600. It's only one tenth of white net worth, which is 171,000. That means on average that for every dollar the middle white household holds in wealth, measured by assets like homes, cash savings, and retirement funds, the middle black household possesses a mere 10 cents. That is uh, wild. I don't even know how anyone can argue with that. Uh, so moreover, home ownership and total wealth do not track each other as closely as many Americans imagine. For example, a survey conducted in the Los, Los Angeles metropolitan area in 2014 to 2015 demonstrates the rate of African-American home ownership, which is 42%, is slightly higher than that of the city's Asian Indians, which is 40%, an immigrant community consisting disproportionately of highly educated affluent professionals. On the basis of home ownership rates, one might expect the Los Angeles communities to have similar net worth, right? 42% of us, and then there's 40% of Asian Indians with home ownership. However, the median Asian Indian household net worth was $460,000 as opposed to only $4,000 for African Americans, less than 1% of the former. 
The difference appears to be due to far greater rates and levels of ownership of financial assets by Asian Indian households. 59% of Asian Indian households own stocks, mutual funds, and investment trusts, while only 22% of African American households own the same types of assets, only 22%. If we consider black and white families with similar income levels, we discover no significant difference in savings rates, uh, nor a difference in rates of return on their personal investments. In fact, in some income categories, blacks display a higher rate of savings. Somehow blacks manage to have a savings profile comparable to whites with similar income levels, despite the fact that Blacks have more kin obligation because their relatives are more likely to be in need than those of comparably situated Whites. You know, I totally agree with this. People always think basic like, oh, you know, all you have to do is just save money, just save money, financial literacy. And, you know, uh, this study is showing that people with the same amount of income, Black people are saving more. They're saving more, despite the fact that they have family members who actually need money. And I can tell you, I have white friends who definitely uh, irresponsibly spend their money. And I think as well, um, white families don't have to worry about like helping out other like white family members. And if they do, like there's enough like people in their family that will take care of them. You know, a lot of white families have social capital. I, I know a few friends who, you know, they might not be rich, they might not have everything, but they have social capital, they have stability, they have security, you know, because of family members. And that's something that most black Americans do not have. So single white women with children have as a high median net worth as black women with no children. Single white parents have more than two times the wealth, 35,000, at the median of married black parents, which is 16,000. Best economic uh, benefits associated with having the ideal family type do not translate into closure of the racial wealth gap. Being a stable, married, two-parent black family far from evens black and white wealth levels. So, you know, there's always that trope of, you know, being, you know, stable and married and a two-parent black family household, you know, that's what needs to happen. Republicans love to pull that mess, but at the same time, have black men as the highest, you know, incarcerated group in the world, you know? Like, it's almost like, it's a, it's a bad joke. Uh, furthermore, there are vast differences in wealth between black and white women. Uh, for example, older, over 60 years of age, single black women with a bachelor's degree have a median net worth of about 11,000, while single white women with a college degree in the same age range have 384,000 in median net worth. Single mothers have negligible wealth, but the racial differences still is palpable. White single mothers have a median net worth of $3,000, but black single mothers have a median net worth of zero. Black household heads with a college or university degree have about $10,000 less in median net worth than white household heads who never completed high school. Blacks who are working full time have a lower median net worth than whites who are unemployed. Black Americans display lower rates of upward mobility and higher rates of downward mobility than white Americans across generations. Generational wealth is what we're about to talk about. In addition, transfers of land, residential property, and business displayed a similar uneven pattern by race. Mueller provides evidence that the source of these disproportionate transfers to whites is in publicly provided assets, including 246 million acres of land, an area approximating that of Florida, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia combined. This transfer occurred under the Homestead Acts, which was between 1860s and 1930s but that is a lot of land. That's a lot of land. Uh, and blacks were largely excluded from the benefits of the Homestead Acts. The Homestead Act land enriched more than 1.6 million white families, both native born and immigrant. By the year 2000, the estimate of the number of adult 
descendants of those original land grant recipients was 46 million people, about a quarter of the US adult population. So I think the Homestead Act was definitely the nail in the coffin when it comes to the black community ever keeping up with white families without reparations. 246 million acres of land was just given to white people and white immigrants. Immigrants who've been here for two minutes come and they get land over a black American descended from slavery in this country. That is robbery right there. There's no way you can put it. And that's why we are advocating for reparations. Homestead acts which denied black people and, and uplifted white people. That is literally reparations for white people right there. Chapter two closes saying, today black white racial disparities are real extensive and quantifiable. The current condition of black Americans is a tragic testament to the nation's brutal racial history. The aim of substantive program of reparations is to produce a race fair America instead of an America that is unable to acknowledge and confront persistent racial inequality. That is chapter two, from here to equality. Make sure you get this book and uh, yeah, make sure you like and subscribe to the video. Deeply appreciate it. And I will see you guys next week on our book club series. Peace.